so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Kyle Snowberger. Uh, he actually uh, is an aerospace design engineer, um, and he actually did use the pro bono program uh, for seeking out his intellectual property, uh, and also uh, through the Philadelphia the pro, pro bono program first off at uh, Wichita State University, and then also through the uh, Philadelphia Volunteer Lawyer for the Arts program. Um, he has actually participated on Shark Tank. Um, a, a shark, oh I'm sorry, not the Shark Tank, a Shark Tank. Um, and he is actually the CEO of Intercept Nexus LLC, which is working on commercializing high altitude air launch techniques. And now he's going to talk a little about his journey here. All right, now I'm live. All right, well, first I apologize for my transit issues, and I guess this is a justifiable punishment where if I can't make the panel I'm supposed to be at, I'm forced to speak for a little bit longer. Um, so just to open the dialogue, um, my story is very similar to Ruth's, as you heard about earlier. Um, and I was an engineer employed at a, you know, a Fortune 500 company in Wichita, Kansas. Um, during a period of time, I, like some engineers in the world, will experience a layoff. And during that period, I wanted to keep my engineering skills sharp. And so I just wanted to work on personal projects. And ideas that naturally came to my mind were the more audacious space travel kind of concepts. And I just sat down on my computer, continued working, and thought, what is a concept that could really promote um, continued progress in space, including human habitation in space. And I thought that the best way to get there would be a air launch method that can deliver, deliver large cargo. And I'll spare you all the details. I could talk about that all day. Um, but when I came up with the concept, I recognized that it should probably be patented. And so a local university, Wichita State University, as Robert mentioned, um, had a resource center there where there was actually a seminar the, Denver Patent Office gave, um, where they brought Zammer in, and I went to that seminar, and they had patent attorneys present. And I was able to get a little bit of a feel for how the process would go. I learned the importance of not disclosing any information prior to seeking patent litigation. And I ultimately learned about the pro bono program. And while I was still in Wichita, I applied to uh, Gateway, which as the name suggests, is in St. Louis. Um, so at this time, pro bono is a wonderful program, but some states are better represented than others. And I was living in one of the Midwestern states that unfortunately wasn't so well represented. Um, and then I moved back to my home state of Pennsylvania. And from there, once I was back home and trying to seek new career options, I applied to Philadelphia Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts, which is the pro bono resource center for the state of Pennsylvania. And quite ironically, actually, I was in Harrisburg. I just had finished touring the state capitol, walking down the street towards the Susquehanna River, when I got an email saying I was matched with a law firm called Ballard Spar LLP. And the name sounded rather formal. Um, and so I Googled what it was, and it was on the 51st and 52nd floor of the BNY Mellon building in Philadelphia. So I realized this was big, and I wasn't prepared for this. <laughs> um, needless to say, and I'm now speaking on a stage in Alexandria, so um, things have changed. The um, process that happened next is where I had reached back out to uh, PVLA, uh, which is part of the Philadelphia Arts and Business Council. And I you know, got to have some phone calls with uh, my patent attorney. So his name is John Chianchio. He's a fine gentleman, a very passionate person from the aviation community. And we got a little bit of a feel for who each other were, like our experiences. We also got to learn about my invention in detail. And it felt really wonderful to really communicate it and just close it and learn about how it can grow. Um, and he sat me down. He said, you have three real inventions here. We think one of them can be patented. And so we, we began. Um, and 
that was through the summer and fall of 2017. Um, and then finally, after a real amount of life change occurred, we uh, filed a patent application in the US on December 26, 2017. Um, and it was a pretty cool Christmas gift, I thought. Um, and then one year later, we filed the PCT. Um, so during that time, I learned more about the application process. I learned about, um, of course, nationalizing over in Europe. And I more or less, though, let my patent attorneys now, um, another gentleman named Tom Brady, join John back at Ballard's Bar. Um, and once the patent application was filed, I felt more freedom to pursue um, commercial interests of the intellectual property. And I set out by starting at a small shark tank at my alma mater, Penn State. They're playing pit in a few hours, by the way. <laughs> so if you don't see me between like noon and three, that's why. <laughs> and um, so I went to the shark tank thinking, uh, I'm probably not going to win. And I was kind of unsure why I was you know, even put into this kind of this outlandish aviation concept. Um, and I went. I won second place. I received a micro grant. Um, it was the first time that Penn State ever paid me anything. <laughs> so, and I, you know, just texted my friends, continued just to tell my story a little bit, like, I can't believe this happened. Um, and being in the aerospace community, I have friends that work for the FAA, I have friends that work for um, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, names you all know here. And a particular friend of mine who worked at Ball, they build satellites in Boulder, Colorado. He told me about this other Shark Tank being hosted at the National Space Symposium. I would say it is the uh, CES show or Invention Con for aviation and the space industry. And Ball happened to be one of the sponsors. So I'm like, what the heck? I'll just throw in a midnight application because I worked on it the two nights before the deadline. And I told my friend I wasn't very happy with him because he told me about it you know, two days before the deadline. And Somehow I was put in, in contention along with 10 other startups, um, some of whom had been operating for years. Um, and also the Air Force was a contestant. They were building a probe to go to Neptune. So I had no idea what I was doing there. Um, and through that experience, I was able to meet uh, Buzz Aldrin. I was able to meet several other space executives. and. That was the first time I recognized that my invention might actually have some credence, and people were interested in it. Um, and that never would have happened if it were not for the pro bono program. Um, so I will never be able to stop giving praises to that, or, you know, that organization that happened through the America Invents Act. And because it really is a unique perspective we have in this country, because to date, no other country in the world, not even in Western, the Western world, has such a program. Um, so to me, to be freely speaking about the pro bono program is to say that independent inventors, not just giant corporations, can change their lives and change the lives of others in many facets of many technologies, um, such as that, um, that bathtub dream we just learned about. I, I can tell you, um, I'm going to buy one for my girlfriend whenever I get back home. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, that's my story, and now I'm commercializing that, um, that technology, um, and I guess I'm ready for some questions from Robert. Okay, um, so I was informed we have about 10 minutes for questions. So we have somebody right here. Um, hello, actually I have a question about the pro bono program. So um, when you were in the program, what kind of engagement letter do you have with your lawyer? and? I guess once um, all the terms were fulfilled, mm -hmm. how did you manage to bridge the, the time when the um, engagement were done and then when you start having money to um, manage your patent and maintain it? Um, so the engagement um, for pro bono litigation, that was more or less, they verified through PVLA, like income standards, they managed like what kind of um, savings account, et cetera, were had and then that was when I was matched to the patent attorneys and the engagement letters, more or less, they were going to continue to represent me pro bono until the end of time, until the world ends, or until, um, you know, until the patent is secured. Um, and, 
Um, I'd have to look at that again. It's been you know, a while since I've seen that, and that's not you know something I keep in the top. I apologize, but essentially it's still pro bono. Um, at Ballard Spar, I also have um, attorneys there that I, I do pay um, on on retainer, but that's more for marketing and for um, business advice. But the actual patent litigation um, is still pro bono to date. Okay. There's not much revenue I can generate with a concept that is being developed and is seven, eight years away. Next question. I guess, uh, folks, uh, do you want to show by hands like you want to bring other panelists back on the stage? So yeah, we I have can, a question. So we can. Uh, the question is uh, for the audience whether you want to bring the other panelists back on the stage so, so we're not gonna we can answer answer the answer. question together. Yeah, well, I think that's not a bad idea, but there actually is going to be an opportunity at the end of the program for any of the panelists and speakers to come up that you can ask questions. And I'm sure that they would be willing to also answer your questions during the break. Okay. Um, the question is for the gentleman. Um, do you think that your success is because you have a highly technological uh, invention? Because many of us do not have such advanced technologies developed. So my question to you is, you think that your path is applied to a common inventor? inventor? Um, that's a good question. Um, I would say, like, to kind of rephrase your question a little bit, that based on my experiences or my education, that it is te it's a technology that I could develop. Um, the, I feel that any person, any human being, could develop something they really have willpower to. More or less, if they see a need, um, and if they're driven, they can fulfill that. Um, it's a matter, matter of willpower. If you look at, for example, like Elon Musk, he had no experience in boring companies. He had no experience in electric cars. He was a, a computer programmer and worked with pay, uh, PayPal and, um, and actually before that was employed designing video games. Um, and now he is the CEO of Electric Car Company um, and several other ventures. So it's a measure of will. Um, experience and education definitely help. Um, my bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering and a hands-on program at Penn State I was part of helped me kind of formulate designs in my head. But more or less, that education gives a mind exposure to technologies. The mind itself is always capable. Um, okay. Okay. I wanted to know, it seems with pro bono, the middle class just doesn't make out. I'm not in an end probably to afford Ballard's Bar. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they charge an hour, but I'm sure it's more than I could afford. But I couldn't go pro bono. So had you not lost your job, yeah. and obviously you didn't own a home and have other assets, mm -hmm. do you think you could have even gone forward with this? This is what my concern is, because the money is huge. I think you have a very valid concern. Um, Thank you. And I would agree to a point that the middle class is somewhat um, left out of the pro bono program. I don't want to say that for certain. I don't represent the patent office. I represent only myself and my company. Um, when, I when I lost my job, I was seeking you know, technology to keep my skills you know, sharp. And from there, it led to an invention. It led to a startup. Um, and even then, after the invention, you know, I, I got reemployed as an engineer at a company. And then after that, I actually um, was no longer employed with that company as well. So those type of life changes do affect how someone can be represented pro bono. Um, and like, like already stated, this country is the only one that has some program like this. So we, I think we should be thankful for at least the step we have now. Um, if I may speak boldly, I feel like every fit, all 50 states should have their own resource center, and perhaps some of the more popular states, Ohio, Illinois, Florida, California, Texas, Pennsylvania, maybe should have more than one um, you know, center around regional hubs, because to help um, underrepresented individuals from the LGBT community that are different minorities, it's really hard to go to some other um, city that's hundreds of miles away. So even in the middle class, it's difficult 
to pay for the travel and such that has to be continually happening. So to answer your question simply, yes, perhaps there could be more that can be done for the middle class. Could you please elaborate on patent litigation? And I, was, I am confused that uh, Pro Bono is doing that also? I'm, I'm sorry, what? Patent litigation that you mentioned, you said that uh, Pro Bono is involved in patent li litigation. And what, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, so um, my experience with it is that after the patent application is filed, um, John, my patent attorney, has just referred that we're in your corner. We're in your corner, you know, until we get our first action report um, from the U.S. Patent Office, which, which has not happened yet. Um, we have heard a first action from the PCT. Um, Europe's very quick. Basically, as soon as you pay the bill, they come right back to you. Um, and we're holding that um, first account on reserve because that kind of helped. I wouldn't say persuade the opinion of the U.S. Patent Office, but it's more like it's more data on file for the, to help them review my patent application here in the States. Um, so perhaps I misspoke, but whenever I refer to like the pro bono patent litigation, that is um, pursuing the patent application in the future. And also, to my understanding, if there are other entities that infringe upon my intellectual property, um, it is my understanding that Ballard Spar would help support me in defending which may be a contingency. Okay. I just wanted to go back to the previous questions, Hi, Cal, yeah. um, regarding the middle class. Um, if you cannot avail yourself of patent pro bono, there is a law school certification clinic, which um, also does work pro bono, and there is a, the patent pro se program here at the uh, U.S. Patent Office. And so for those who can't avail themselves of patent pro bono, there are other options. Um, that the uh, PTO does offer. Are there any other questions? Well, I'll, I'll ask one last question then. So what would you say were the biggest challenges um, I know you, you haven't received your patent yet, but what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced, at least getting to this point? Um, the biggest challenges, I would say, would be my own um, certainty of my own confidence. Um, some inventions have expanded scope um, than others, and but all the inventions more or less are equal in the eyes of the patent office. Um, I had the urge early on to seek validation which, of course, would require disclosure, and that was you know, a big no-no. And so to come this far, to me, is a great honor, and I'm very thankful for the opportunity to be speaking in front of you, because um, my story is not over yet, and it's also one that you know, each day to day, um, I sometimes contemplate just because something can be done, should it be done. And so that's a challenge I face, recognizing the implications of radical technology change very rapidly. Um, like, look at the cell phones in our pockets. You know, even 15, 20 years ago, we never would have imagined we'd be so electronically connected. Um, but there are sometimes some, you know, misadvancements, like it might alienate us a little bit. Um, so I feel with my invention, I want to make sure I pursue it in a way that has the best game for society. And that's a challenge I face and I continually face. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you.